concept of Corona was a dream of mine since I was very young. I didn't bring it to fruition until I was much older. And basically what it is, is we all have a story to tell. Um, and a lot of people were not aware of my story, of their stories. And they were a little bit shocked to find out what our humble beginnings were and how we became so successful. So never underestimate the power of your story. It is inspirational, it is motivational, it can save someone's life. My message to all the women out there and to everyone out there who may be facing adversity, never forget how amazing you are. Never forget how exceptional you are. Ajusta tu corona and keep it moving. Good evening and welcome to Conversations with Ajusta Tu Corona. If you're watching me, say hello. I'm so happy we have a special guest. All my guests are special, so I get super excited. Um, so tonight we have a little treat for you. I see people giving me hearts and likes. Say hello. Hi, Milagros. Welcome. Milagros, I would think you'd be would be working overtime right now. It's tax season. Um, I'm gonna bring on our special guest. I don't wanna wait any longer. I spoke to her yesterday, had the most amazing conversation with her, and I'm sure you will be thrilled with everything that she is gonna share with us this evening. I'm not even gonna tell you her name. I'm gonna let her introduce herself. Just a second. Hi! Hello, how are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. It's Thursday, the weekend's almost here. I'm, you know, enjoying it. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. So, I tell everybody a little bit about yourself, just a little bit. Sure. <laughs> so, my name is Amarilis Correa. If you want to Americanize it, it's a Amarilis. <laughs> I always say, you know, because um, sometimes living here in Miami, I'll, uh, obviously there's a lot of Latinos here. And so I, living up north, I got used to introducing myself as Amarillis. So whenever I introduce myself down here, somebody's like, it's Amarillis. No, yeah. Amarillis. <laughs> I'm like, you're right. You're right. Um, <laughs> I am. <clears throat> I am the owner and founder of Ace Travels Agency. So I help to curate culturally immersive experiences for clients, um, really just help encouraging people to get out and see the world and experience new cultures. Uh, I am originally from Norwalk, Connecticut. Uh, I have been living in Miami Beach, Florida now for five years. Um, and in between my time in Connecticut and Florida, I kind of uh, moved around a little bit. So we'll get into all of those details <laughs> throughout the course of the show. But um, I, I, I obviously love to travel. It's one of my biggest passions, but I'm also a reader, uh, love to read. I try to read at least like five books a month and between wow. fiction and self-help books. Um, some of them I listen to because, you know, between moving around and stuff, it's just easier to do audiobooks sometimes. But um, I love learning about new places and new things and people. Um, I am a beach bum as well. I live right near the beach. So I try to get out and enjoy the sun and nature as much as possible. Um, and then, you know, I have a bunch of other little hobbies here and there that I love to kind of like dibble and dabble in. <laughs> She's going to tell us a lot about her dibble and dabbling, but Amaris <laughs> happens to be from the same town that I'm from. And we lived on one side of the tracks and she lived on the other side of the tracks. So we didn't get to see each other. We didn't go to the same schools, but we knew of each other because Norwalk is but so big. But I remember her parents exactly fondly. Her mom was singing in the chorus at church. Her dad was this really <laughs> hardworking carpenter. So I knew the families, we knew each other. And isn't it a small world that we would cross paths loving two of the same things? Exactly. The first one being travel, which is how I started to follow her, but she has roots and organizations that are dear and near to my heart. So she's going to tell you a little bit more 
about my question to her yesterday, and I'll let her answer also today is, how did you leave little Norwalk? Because <laughs> everyone wants to know, how did you get out of Norwalk? <laughs> uh, you know, it's ironic because you leave and you never really, you leave, but you never really leave. Like mm -hmm. my family's still there, so I go back frequently, right? Um, so I, I was telling Lillian my story about you know, growing up in Norwalk, much like a lot of other Puerto Ricans whose parents, you know, migrated from Puerto Rico to the United States. I grew up in a very strict Puerto Rican household. Um, at least all us females know this, right? Men, maybe not so much, but females, we know this. <laughs> so um, I'm the oldest of four daughters. And so my parents growing up, um, really kind of want to instill the Puerto Rican culture in us, which they did a wonderful job of doing that. You know, in, at home, we spoke Spanish. Um, we watched Spanish programming. We ate Puerto Rican food. And we really kind of, we my parents instilled in us everything that I think they would have instilled in us had we been growing up in Puerto Rico. It's just that we were in Connecticut instead. So because of this, <laughs> because I was the oldest, because they were new, to Norwalk for the most part, um, when I, you know, when I was born, they were very strict and very protective. And at the time I hemmed and hawed about it and I was like so upset that they were so strict. But now in hindsight, I'm I'm very grateful for that because it made me who I am today. And I appreciate that about them. Um, so as I was going through high school, my biggest thing was like, I gotta get out of this house. <laughs> I think we can all relate, right? Like mm -hmm. my parents are driving me insane. I just need to get out of this house. And so for me, the me the next immediate step was to go to college. Like I was like, I'm just gonna go to college. I'm gonna find a place close enough, but not too close. And I'm I'm gonna go to college. And I should be saying that the reason for going to college was because you know, my education was so important to me. <laughs> but being a naive 16, 17 year old, I was just trying to get out of the house to be honest, just to be very transparent. <laughs> so I got it. I, so I had gone, I applied to several colleges, one in Philadelphia, one in, in Delaware, and one in, at U, one which was UConn in stores, Connecticut. And I got into all three, but my mom was like, you're not going to school in Philadelphia. <laughs> Delaware was really expensive and UConn was affordable because I was in state. It was also importantly, far enough from home that my like my parents would have to call to come see me, but close enough that I could still come home or they can come visit, right? So it's like a perfect balance. So I accepted the invitation to join UConn and I went off to college and uh, got exposed to people from all over the States and other countries. It was a great experience. I'm glad I did it. And then I had, I originally went into college thinking, I'm going to be an engineer. Didn't work out for me. <laughs> so I decided to switch uh, careers or, or um, studies and I went into business and communications. And then I decided, I was like, when I, while I was in college, I started working for this printing company. I would work evenings and every night, like uh, when I was working, all these ad executives would come into the printing company and I started like just chit chatting with them and learning about the business. And I was like, I'm going to go work in New York City and I'm going to be an advertising executive. That's what I'm going to do. And so I kind of set that intention in my mind, like that's what I want to do. I became friendly with one of the ladies who would come in. And so my first job out of college wasn't exactly in New York City. It was in Stamford, Connecticut. But I had a friend who was going to fashion, um, to interior design school in New York. And she was like, hey, do you want a room with me in New York? And I was like, sure. It was just another way for me to get out of Connecticut and not end up going mm -hmm. back home, right? So I'm like, yeah, sure. So I moved into an apartment with her in New York and I would commute back and forth from New York to Stanford. I, I did my first job for like a year and then I got an interview at a big ad agency in New York City. And I was like, this is it, this is my opportunity. I'm going to take it. I interviewed and I got the job. And then I spent 10 plus years um, in advertising. And I moved up the ranks and I got to do all kinds of brand work for, comp for companies like Verizon and American Express. 
it was it was awesome it was a great experience just being that young you know in your 20s living in new york in new york and going out in the city and and working in corporate just experiencing all that um and then i had a little bit of like this i don't know i like to call it a mini midlife crisis even though i was in midway through my life yet <laughs> it was like a quarter life crisis life crisis. I don't know. And I decided one day, I was like, there has to be more to life than just this, like just working every day, going to corporate America, doing this day in and day out. And I decided on a whim one day, I just had a thought and I didn't even think about it too much. I just decided I was going to do it. And I applied to the Peace Corps. <laughs> and I did I didn't even think I didn't I didn't really kind of think it through. I just decided I was going to do it. And it's funny enough, and I'll talk about this later, like that it was one of the best decisions I ever made, the decision I thought the least about and the best decision I ever made. Um, I ended up getting in, obviously. I found out about a year later because the process takes took that long at the time. And I decided to leave everything. I left my job. I left everything. And I went to Madagascar <laughs> and I lived in a wood hut and I worked with, I lived in this little community in Madagascar called Ambubum Bay. And I had to like learn the language and I had to learn the customs and the etiquettes and learn how to just survive and go from being in this big city where I had access to everything and everyone, right? At any moment in time that I wanted it to this desert town in the middle of nowhere, like, and learn how to like survive just on my own and how to communicate and how to, you know, like just live day in and day out. And while I was there, I worked with local artisans, primarily women, helping them set up their businesses and helping them learn about the basics of business, whether it be um, how to price their products, how to differentiate themselves from competition, um, basic marketing skills, basic accounting skills, how to apply for like microfinancing or micro loans from NGOs and so forth. Um, so all of those, I, I was able to apply all of the basic business skills that I had learned over the years. I was able to kind of pass it forward and share it with a lot of the local artisans in the community. Um, it was, it also was a pivotal time for me because I, I told you this yesterday, like it changed my whole outlook and my whole perspective on life. I went from being this woman who was working in New York City, making six figures, buying my Louis Vuitton bags and my shoes and all my stuff, and to someone who was like, that is not the definition of happiness, right? Like I being in being in this community and seeing these people who had so little right? Like in, in comparison to what we have, we, I think sometimes we get lost on us, the privilege that we have mm -hmm. and just how blessed we are. These people would give you their last piece of food, right? To welcome you and to, and, and they do it with a smile and they're so gracious. And it was just like in this, and they were happy. They were happy with, you know, with nature and the basics and they didn't need all these, this extra stuff to be happy. And it just made me realize, like, I was like, I've been focused on all the wrong stuff, <laughs> you know? And I really came back a completely changed woman. I had a whole new perspective on life. I kind of was like, I don't need these expensive purses. I don't need these expensive shoes anymore. Don't get me wrong. I, I, I like them. I look at them. I admire them. But it wasn't like this necessity where like it was before. Like I kind of felt like before that I was in this place where like it was a status symbol in some way, shape or form. And and then after Madagascar, I was like, that's not even important. Um, so, so I ended up. Say? I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry. What would you say you gained from Madagascar? I gained a sense of appreciation for just the basic things in life and enjoying what you have in the moment and not worrying about what you don't have or what you want to get like really learning to be more present you know and um just be happy like without all the extra stuff um i also learned i think i there i developed my passion for learning about cultures 
because I was so enthralled. Like I loved learning every little bit of everything I could about that culture. I loved like soaking it up and I would ask questions. And if I got invited to things, I would go. I got invited once to, so I got invited once to a funeral in Madagascar. And for me, I was like, I need to go see this because I need to go see how they do this, right? Because it's so different from our Western countries. And so my, I had this family that lived next door as a family of 10. And they're like, we're going to this a uh, funeral out in the countryside. It was pretty far out um, in the middle of nowhere. And they're like, do you want to come with us? I was like, sure. So they come pick me up in the morning and they're in an ox cart. It's literally like a wagon with like two oxen in the front who's pulling them, right? And I'm like, all right, let's do this. So I get in and I had to dress like they call uh, folks from Madagascar Malagasy. So I had to dress like them because I was going to like, you know, something formal and I want to be respectful. So I'm like wearing this hat and this skirt that I've wrapped around me, right? Like really just, I'm like all decked out in Malagasy wear. And so I get on this ox cart and we're like moving along. I could have ran faster than that ox cart was moving, but I was like, okay. <laughs> so we get to this community out in the middle of nowhere and there's hundreds of people out there and they're, um, on one side are the men and on the other side are the women and the women are like mourning the death of this gentleman who passed away and he's in this little tiny hut and the men are on the other side and they're like dancing and they're singing and they're with their spears and their little pointy hats and it was just like something out of a National Geographic magazine. Like that's how I felt. I was like, oh my God, I just walked into like a National Geographic magazine. So. But like watching all of this and just like in amazement, right? And um, so I was with this family. So they walk us into this little house um, made of wood and they sit us down and they sit us with this um, in the middle of all of us. We're in a circle. There's this pot of rice. Right. And I'm like, OK. And I was starving. So I was like, oh, I'm ready to eat, thinking like, oh, they're going to give us plates or whatever. Yeah, right. No, no, no. So they give us a spoon, one spoon. And everybody has to take turns with the spoon. And, you know, like you put a Westerner in that situation. They're like, what? <laughs> I got to share a spoon with someone else. But to not to not eat is would be offensive, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I just. I just sucked it up and ate. <laughs> I ate a little bit, but I ate just enough, right? Like where I wasn't being, I wasn't being offensive. So then we come out and everybody's dancing and singing. And of course I'm like the odd man out. I don't look like any of them. So I'm getting stared at and, you know, they're all like looking at me and they're asking me questions. And so one of the uh, traditions in Madagascar, well, in Southern Madagascar, not in, because you know, Madagascar is pretty big and there's a lot of different um, cultures within Madagascar and they have their own traditions. So um, where I was, one of the traditions was that every family that came to the funeral got a gift. It's kind of like their way of showing appreciation. So, so the family that I was with got a gift. Their gift was a cow, right? Like, <laughs> But yes, this is, a, this is a sign of wealth, right? So they got a cow, and I got a goat. <laughs> so I get to like ride back on this ox cart with a goat all the way back to my village, to my to my house, and um, so I'm riding in this goat like that next to me. I'm like, what am I gonna do with this goat? Like, I have no clue what how to raise a goat. I don't know anything about that. So we get back to the house and I say to the family, I'm like, do you want my goat? Cause I don't really know. And they're like, are you sure? You know, cause obviously goat is gonna give them milk, eventually meat, if, you know, whatever. And I'm like, yeah, you can have it. I don't really know what to do with it. Like, and so they're like, oh, we're gonna make a big dinner. So they made this turkey dinner for me to, to thank me. And uh, they were so excited about the goat and I was just happy to like, be able to to contribute in some way. <laughs> so, so these are just like that's just one story. I've had so many stories of moments that I was like, am I really living this? And I think the other thing that Madagascar taught me was 
more so than at any other point in my life. Like life is a roller coaster and you're going to have your ups and your downs. And because there were moments where I was so elated because I was so thrilled to be in this place that was so different. And then there were other moments where I was like, what did I do? Oh my God, like I just left everything to come to this country that I don't know anyone, where I don't know anyone. And Did I they have power? Did they no. have electricity? <laughs> yeah, it sounds like no, they did. <laughs> so I remember calling my mom one day and I was like, mom. And I like, I heard her voice and I think I was just in one of those like lulls of the roller coaster, you know, like I wasn't on my high. And I called my mom and I was like, and I have to say to my mom's credit, because as surprised as I think she was and as worried as I think she was that I was about to embark and go on this trip to this country that I didn't know anyone, when she heard me crying, she didn't say to me, come home. She said, it's going to be okay. You're going to be fine. Give it some time. If you're still not happy in a couple of months, you can always come back, you know? And so I to me, I always remember that because it was just her way of like, instead of giving into her fears, she just encouraged me. And that to me was an, like, was a big deal. Like it was important to me. Mm -hmm. So I ended up coming back from Madagascar and I was working in the city, um, not particularly happy because I kind of had gone back into what I was doing before. And um, then I, I was applying for a job in New York. I went to interview and the president of the company that I was interviewing with said to me, hey, you know, we have an opportunity in Mexico City. Um, we could use someone like you that has your experience and speak Spanish to to run help to run that office and grow the clientele like the business. And I was like, yeah, sure. Why not? <laughs> this is kind of how I live my life, Lillian. Like, yeah, sure. Why not? So uh, they sent me to Mexico City for a weekend. I had never been there. They sent me for a weekend just to check it out to see if I actually would like it. I went, I like walked around, I checked out things and I came back and I was like, yeah, I'll take the job, no problem. And two months later, I was on a plane to Mexico City. Worked in Mexico City, got to really, for me, that was a learning experience in the sense that I went from doing business in English to doing business in purely Spanish. Mm -hmm. And I worked with a lot of clients all over Latin America. And um, it just, one, it helped to improve my business Spanish because I speak Spanish leisurely, but you know, for us, it's very like slang Spanish. It wasn't like yes. very formal. So it helped me improve my, the formality of my Spanish. Um, it helped me learn a lot more about the Mexican culture and the Mexican people. And I got to travel all over Mexico and it was kind of going back to, oh, wow, this culture is amazing, right? Like th there was this theme that kept coming up for me. And so um, I was in Mexico for, for a little while. And then one day I was at work and I had the, almost like a kind of like a mini stroke and um, I got rushed to the hospital and I find out while I'm in Mexico City that I have this thing. At the time, they didn't know if it was a, like a cyst or a tumor um, that was growing in my frontal right lobe of my brain, and I needed to have surgery to have it removed. So my mom was like, "You are not having surgery in Mexico. You need to bring your ass back here." Excuse my language, but <laughs> <laughs> so I I come back to New York and to Connecticut in New York, and I have surgery. And so I had brain surgery. I recovered for a couple months and then I was like, okay, I'm ready to go back. Went back to Mexico. And a year later, literally like a year from the time of my surgery, uh, the cyst that I had in my brain had regrown again. So I had to have another surgery. And um, I was at this point dealing with seizures and just trying to figure out like what was going on because I, I ended up having these like I don't know what they're called, like symptoms as a result of this first surgery. So I had the second surgery. I left the hospital with a walker. Like I had to kind of like go through therapy and just figure out some motor functions again. Um, and then it was kind of like, there was this moment where I had to decide, do I go back to Mexico or do I stay in the States? Because my doctors are here and there, there was already discussions about the fact that I would need to have a third surgery and it was going to be more invasive. And I was like, I can't keep having brain surgery every year. Like that's not, <laughs> how does that work? You know? Mm -hmm. But I think I told you this yesterday after that second surgery, like 
I realized that I was living in this space of victimhood. Like I was thriving in that victim space, right? Like, woe is me. Why is this happening to me? I don't understand. And I was feeling sorry for myself. And I was almost enjoying the sympathy that I was getting from people. And I just started realizing that I was like, I don't want to be that person. I don't want to be that person who like thrives off of that and lives in that space. And so I made it a point at that moment in time. I was like, I, this is not going to be my story. This is not going to be how people know me. This is not going to be what defines me. You know, I'm just going to set it in my mind that this thing is not going to come back. I'm not going to have another surgery and I'm going to get back to living my life and traveling and doing all the things that I want to do. And I, it never grew back. <laughs> my seizures have been under control since then. And I tell people all the time, like your mind has so much power, so Absolutely. much power. Mindset is everything. If you believe it, if you say it, if you set the intention, you genuinely believe it and you live your, you take action based off that, I promise you what you want will happen. It will come to fruition. Um, and I, and I'm a testament to that because I genuinely believe, I don't care what anybody tells me, cause I know the doctors didn't do anything. I genuinely believe that that cyst has not grown back because I decided that it wasn't going to grow back. <laughs> like that's, just, <laughs> that's just how I see it, you know? And I, I had already, well, once I started working and I was, um, living in New York, working in corporate America, I started traveling and it gave me life. Just getting out there, meeting new people, uh, experiencing new things. My time in Madagascar and Mexico just highlighted that even more because it allowed, it gave me the opportunity to really like immerse myself versus being somewhere for just a couple of days here and there, you know? Um, and so ever since my surgeries and living you know, making that decision that I wasn't going to live my life as a victim. Um, I have just gone for it. Like I started my business a couple of years ago. It's, I'm not gonna lie, it's been hard because of COVID, but I love it. I show up every day. I do what I do with love and passion because it's something I genuinely enjoy. I wish to make travel accessible for everybody. I think I told you this yesterday, like I've had people Absolutely. say to me like, you should teach, you should uh, work in luxury travel. And there's nothing wrong with that. Don't get me wrong. There's, I know some wonderful agents that do luxury travel, but the way I see it, I don't want to do travel for people who have the means and the capability to do it all the time. I want to do travel for people who like, this is their dream trip, right? And they have been in their mind, they've been envisioning, I want to help that materialize. I want to see that dream come to fruition and I want to help them do it in a way that works for them if possible, you know, obviously managing expectations, because if you're traveling on a smaller budget, you're not going to get some of the luxuries that somebody on a larger budget has. But I, as, as a, as a Latina woman who had parents who worked really hard to give us the little that they could, right? Like they gave us they, they gave us a great life. Um, we didn't have all of the luxuries of doing all the stuff. Like, I feel like Latinos don't get a chance to really like get out and explore and see the world as much as we should. And like, I know so many people who Absolutely. I would love to, yeah. Or, they're, or they have fear or they're like, mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know how to do that. I don't know where to find deals. I don't know this, I don't know that. So that's my goal really is just to help people see the world. When I was, um like for the, everyone who watches me, they know that there was a time that I didn't travel at all. And like, um, I feel that on the opposite side of the spectrum, when we were growing up, our American friends, their families were always going on vacation with them and taking them on vacation. And we did not. So our demographic didn't really know um, how huge the world is out there and the opportunities that you can go and visit. So I started traveling um, faithfully probably around 2015 and I have not looked back and it is has opened my mind to a world that is 
absolutely unbelievable. And I'm on my kids all the time, like take a vacation, stop spending your money, go on vacation, go see the world. I even, my son, when he came out of college, he was undecided about what he wanted to do. And I said to him, find a friend and backpack across Europe. Yeah. I will, you know, I'll help you because I want you to be out there in the world and see what it's about before you settle down. Mm -hmm. And so I encourage it. I encourage it to, you know, who's watching our followers and everything. Before we get into more of the travel, somebody, Milagros is asking for how to contact you. So I'm just going to put up um, her banner. So yes. this is her travel agency website. And I'm sure she has a contact page that you can go on and request travel. She will create packages, big, small, whatever you need. Um, she currently created a package that I and five other friends will be traveling to Dubai <laughs> in September. So I'm super excited about that. Um, but as always, you know that we have people come on this program to talk about what they can offer the women of the world and women of adversity. So mm -hmm. she offers the experience of travel, but also, Amarilis, you spoke to me yesterday about the Lotus House. Yes. The Lotus House. <laughs> Tell me, how did you learn about the organization and what do you do for them? Sure. So uh, I have always been of the school of thought that wherever you live, whatever community you live in, you should always give back. I've done it almost everywhere where I've lived. I've tried to find some way of giving back. I, um, my time in Madagascar really um, working with a lot of the ladies really gave me this passion and love for helping other women, especially women who maybe don't have haven't had the opportunities that I have had. So I always feel like, you know, pay it forward. So when I came here to Miami, I was looking for an opportunity to volunteer and I started doing some research. I wanted to specifically be able to use the skill sets that I have, whether it be business, you know, business related or my experience in some way, shape or form to be able to contribute or use that to help in the organization. So I did a search online. I had looked at a, a bunch of women's shelters. Um, some of the opportunities really didn't fit my expertise. And then I came across this opportunity with the Lotus House. So I reached out to them and I was like, I'm looking to volunteer. We'd love to you know, give several hours a week to the Lotus House if you're willing to have me. So they accepted and I went on, I went in and I was working Initially, I was just working. They have an education center at the at the Lotus House. Um, it is an, a woman's only shelter, and uh, they had this education center. And they had women who were looking for jobs and didn't really know like how to put a resume together, how to do job searches online. So I would go in a couple of days a week, and I would sit down in the education center and kind of anybody who walked in, if they needed help with their resume, I would help them put a resume together, kind of just talking through what their experience was, and then outlining it and, and helping them prepare it and word it in a way that they could then communicate it to somebody if they were interviewing. I also would spend time helping them look for jobs online. Um, I remember I had a young lady who was looking for t uh, work like in hotels, um, like doing cleaning at hotels. And so we had applied for some hotel jobs and no one was getting back to her because much like us, you know, you submit a resume into the abyss in the internet and then you don't hear back, right? So I remember saying to her, I was like, Alejandra, just like, if if you don't hear back by this day, go to the hotel and just say, hi, I applied for this position. Can I, you know, is it possible to speak to the hiring manager? And just say, look, I, I've been trying to get in touch with somebody. I said, you have nothing to lose and everything to gain from just taking that initiative. This is something you want. So you need to take the initiative. Nobody's going to come to like hand it to you, you know? Mm -hmm. So she did it. She did it. She said she was nervous, but she went into the, I think it was the Hyatt. She went into Hyatt and she's like, asked to speak to, to the hiring manager. She told them she had applied. So the hiring manager came and has said to her like, well, we, we haven't really looked at all the applicants yet. And she's like, well, I just wanted to let you know that I applied and I'm very interested. I hadn't heard back. And, and the guy ended up hiring her on the spot. the spot and she was so happy. 
And I was so happy for her. And I was like, you have to go after what you want and just take it. Like, stop asking for permission. Just do it. You know, like I always say, don't ask for permission, ask for forgiveness. Do it. And then if somebody yells at you, ask for forgiveness, right? So, <laughs> so she ended up getting the job and she was so thrilled. So I did that for a while. And then at one point, the director of the education center, I said to her, I was like, you know, um, we were having a conversation and I said, you know, the missing ingredient that I see with a lot of these ladies is confidence, like that self-confidence. And I'm like, because I can pretty up a resume. I can make it look beautiful. I can use all this like lingo and stuff. But if you walk in there and you don't have the presence and you don't have the confidence to be able to speak to what's on that piece of paper, they're going to know that it's not, you know what I'm saying? Like it's not real or it's or you're not you're not the way you're portraying yourself on paper so she's like would you be interested in putting together like a self-confidence class um like a multi-week self-love mm -hmm. self and self-confidence mm -hmm. and so i started doing that for the lotus house and it was awesome just having those conversations really kind of um talking through what is self-confidence the fact that everybody all of us we all suffer from imposter syndrome. We all have that little voice who tells us sometimes, like, who do you think you are? Who? I mean, I still suffer from it. <laughs> like, sometimes <laughs> I'm like, who do you think you are to be telling people, like, they should be doing this when they're traveling, or they should be doing that. Like, and, you know, it's our, it's our subconscious trying to keep us in a safe place, right? Like, you're mm -hmm. kind of scared to put yourself out there. So I would, I did these, these multi-week courses for the ladies and, it was great. Like I would get so much interaction. People would get excited. Um, they would share with me the fact that like, I would say to them, like, what is your dream? If you could be doing anything, anything in with your life, like what would you be doing? And when, you know, one lady would be like, oh, I would have a hair salon. Another lady was like, I would be a pilot. And, and, you know, my thing was like, do you know, do you understand that this is all available to you? Like it's possible. Are you gonna have to do some work to get there? Absolutely, but it's all very possible. And you know, it's it's um it's hard with women who have left everything to go live in a shelter with their kids to see the possibilities. It takes really somebody to kind of sit down and say to them, This is all very possible. It it maybe not tomorrow, but it's possible, like you can do this and just give them that inspiration and that hope. And so I loved I loved doing that at the Lotus House because it just left me like their their happiness and their hope would just transfer over to me as well, you know. I know. <laughs> I understand. We have a couple people that we'd like to say hello to. So we have Richard. Richard happens to be my oldest son who never misses my show. If he's not Hi, on, Richard. I worry. <laughs> And we have Maritza, who happens to be one of the ones traveling to Dubai. Hi, oh, Maritza. <laughs> <laughs> so with what you did at the Lotus House, and, and I understand how that transfers, you, there's a statement that we discussed yesterday about helping and For being sure. of service. <laughs> and tell our audience what the difference is. Yes. So helping, and by the way, I'm not going to take credit for this. I actually read it in a book, but it stood out to me and I now have embraced it. Um, so when you say that you're helping someone, it's coming from a place of privilege and uh, like st status, like you have the ability, like you, you're helping someone. It's almost like, I don't want to say condescending because it's not condescending, but it's just coming from a place of privilege. Whereas if you say you're of service, it's you're there for that that person's needs, whatever they whatever they require in that moment, right? So you're really in service versus I'm helping you, I'm just giving you whatever. <laughs> so whatever I have to offer you in that moment. Um, so I have I've embraced that philosophy and I've tried to change my language. The help still slips in because it's sub, it's subconscious for me, but I it, that really stood out to me. Um, I try now to like be of service or in service 
you know, versus thinking, oh, I'm helping these women. No, I'm being of service. I'm sharing the knowledge that I have and whatever it is that they, whatever it is that they need from me in the moment, that's what I'm sharing with them, you know, versus I'm just going into help. Uh, help seems very temporary to me. If that makes sense. <laughs> Absolutely. And I love it. I have a friend that tells me that constantly. She said, well, you found your calling, which is being of service. Yep. Yes. What and you're much, you're much happier when you're of service. Oh, you know? I, I believe so. Mm -hmm. And 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 I look at it as a blessing. Like I, I feel in my heart, I feel that I'm doing God's work because that's what he was about. Tell me out of all the places you've been, out of all of the things that you've done, because you have traveled to many places, you have traveled with many groups, what do you consider to be your biggest accomplishment? What do I consider to be my biggest accomplishment? Honest, I mean, to be honest with you, I feel like my biggest accomplishment is waking up. I feel like I lived the better part of my youth and into my 30s, right? Like mid 30s, I kind of felt like I was just going through the motions. Like I wasn't really being present. I really wasn't enjoying everything that I had. I kind of just was like, well, this is this is this is just the way things are. And I think my my awakening process probably started when I went to the Peace Corps, when I went to Madagascar. I didn't realize it in that moment. I don't think I knew that, but that I think that's when it started. I think only maybe, I would say at the onset of COVID is when I think I started to realize how everything had happened in my life and the fact that it had happened for a reason and it was supposed to get me from that point to where I am today. And so, I went on right at the onset of COVID. COVID, you know, COVID has uh, um, negative connotations for a lot of people. For me, COVID was was eye opening, in the sense that, like, I went on a more spiritual path. I really started to look inward. I really started to be more conscious of my thoughts, how I thought about things, what I said to myself, how I talked to myself. Um, really really embracing this concept of like you create your own reality you create your own life like your thoughts create your own your life and if you think positively and you look at things from a positive standpoint you will always see opportunity whereas if you think negatively and you look at the negative side of everything you're only ever going to see the bad you're never going to see the good because that's what you're focused on and what you focus on expands so if all you see is bad or the bad things like, oh, this happened to me. I can't believe this happened to me. Why is this happening to me? Well, guess what? That's what you're going to get more of. And so when that's why when I had my second surgery and I was like, no, we're going to get out of this place. I don't want more of this. I want to me, that was a learning experience and it was supposed to wake me up. I just my awakening happened over the course of several years. So for me, I think that's what I'm most proud of, that I finally got to a place where I've realized a lot of this stuff and I'm more conscious. I'm more conscious of people around me. I'm more conscious of like feeling people's energy and really kind of picking up on my own intuition and listening to, to the things that go through my head and the little voices. A lot of the ideas that I have for my business, no lie, are little voices that kind of just come up in the middle of the day and i'm like oh, i need to do that that like i tell people all the time the, the ideas that come to you they come to you for a reason they're they're not by chance right they're supposed to lead you towards your calling like what you're supposed to be doing in life and when you do what you love you're just you're gonna be happy there's no way around it and i honestly think that part of the reason why i met my husband when i met my husband was because i was at a place where i was genuinely happy with my life i wasn't looking for a partner i wasn't looking for someone i was just living my life i was happy i enjoyed every moment of it and then bam here he comes and he added to it he, mm -hmm. he doesn't he doesn't complete me he doesn't he just added to my joy and my happiness and lord knows i spent you know i spent the better part of my 
my earlier years, like, I'm like, oh, when am I going to meet somebody? When am I going to get married? This and that. And, and when I stopped looking and I just focused on me and my happiness, there he was. There he comes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I know that sounds kind of odd to that to be your biggest accomplishment, but to me, that is that is my probably my biggest accomplishment. And I think if anything, it enhances my work because it makes me focus more on the people that I'm servicing. Right? Like, I'm focused more on the experience versus the idea of crossing things off of a bucket list. Um, I want to go to places. I want to meet people. I want to eat their food. I want to drink their drinks. I want to dance their dances. I want to try their language, even though I'm horrible at languages, but I want to try. Like, <laughs> I want to do all those things and then leave this world with the, all those experiences. To me, that's more valuable than any of the material things that you could have in life. Now, you have traveled so much more than me. Is there a favorite of yours? their favorite. No, you know, I feel like every so often you'll hear me say, oh, this is one of my favorite places. But I, <laughs> I have a ton of favorite places because I honestly feel that every place has its own unique thing to offer the world. It can't be duplicated anywhere else. And so if you're able to tap into that, um, you slowly start to realize like, this is my favorite because of this. This is my favorite because of that. So for instance, like Venezuela is one of my favorite countries from a landscape perspective, like just between, I got the chance in Venezuela to go sailing for several days. And then I was able to go into the jungle. I got to hike Angel Falls. I got to go hang out with the indigenous Indians that live out in the, in the, in the jungle and like listen to them speak their language and eat their foods and try. And so from a topography perspective, like a land perspective, I thought it was, I, it, for me, it was one of the most beautiful places. And then I went to Peru and I was like, oh, this is like on a whole other level. Like, <laughs> it's like between the history and like going to Rainbow Mountain and Cusco and, and, um, Machu Picchu and going to see the Nazca lines. Like, it was just like, how had I not seen this yet? Right. Um, and I think also, it would, I always ask people whenever they ask me to like curate a trip for them. Uh, when I do my consultations, one of the first things I ask is like, what do you want to get out of this? Like, what do you want your experience to be? Like, are you looking to just go chill and relax? Or do you want to come back in awe of like new things and new, like, because that's really going to define how you plan that trip for that person. And I also try to get to know my clients on a more personal level because everybody's different. And part of, you know, I tell people all the time, like, oh, people will be like, I want to be a travel agent. And I'm like, this is not as glamorous as everybody thinks. Like <laughs> I tell people, I'm like, it's not about just travel. I mean, it's great. It's one of the perks of it, but this is a people's a people business. It is a knowing how to read people, knowing how to read between the lines, knowing how to pick up on people's vibe and energy and be like, you know what, this probably wouldn't work for this person, but this would, like they would probably love this, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and just picking up on those little nuances. Um, like I said, travel is just, you know, it's one of the benefits of it, but it's not, it's not the end all be all of this business, so. I tell people, I'm like, if you don't like people, this is not the business to go into. <laughs> there was something that you spoke about yesterday that I want to bring to um, people's attention also when it comes to the services you provide. So as Amarilis stated, you can go online and book any ATV, any zip lining, do any type of service. But she has the ins and out where you may and, and, and knows like, the private drivers or the small mom and pop shops or the small mom and pop drivers where if you want to more intimately get to know the culture, she's the person to see. Yes. <laughs> so one of my goals, I was telling Lillian yesterday that one of the things I, in the travel business, one of the things that I've seen is, you know, the smaller mom and pop 
tour providers, the ones who are taking you into a town and really kind of showing and introducing you to the people and the food and the dancing and the culture and all that other stuff, right? They get lost in the shuffle. Because they're a small business, they don't have the budgets to do all the marketing that the big players do. So a lot of times when you're searching, a lot of people will go online and they'll search to do a trip and they'll look at the first two or three pages of Google. Those little mom and pop shops, they're sitting in page seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, right? Because on the search, they're not coming up. They're not, they don't have the money to do paid search or organically. They don't, they haven't set up their SEO because they don't have that capability to actually be able to come up at the top of the list from an organically search perspective. So one of the things that I have, one of the things I decided early on in my business was that I want to highlight these businesses because I do these tours when I go on my trips. And one of the things I always get asked by people is like, how do you find these experiences? How do you put stuff together? And it's like, I do a lot of research. I do a lot of research. I talk to people. I have friends all over the world because I make friends everywhere. If you ask my husband, he'll tell you I could talk to a wall. <laughs> but that's just, <laughs> that's just how I am. It's I want to like really maintain connections and I stay in touch with them via social media. I, I still, you know, I went to Georgia, to the Republic of Georgia a couple of years ago and I made so many friends. I still talk to them on WhatsApp. We still communicate all the time. Like to me, life is about human connections, right? And I was saying to Lillian, like one of the things that I think being a cultural traveler does is it creates more compassionate, kind and empathetic people. Because while you might eat different foods from the next person, or you might speak a different language, or you might have different customs, there might be, you have different reasons for why you do, you, you practice a different religion. At the end of the day, as different as we all are, we're actually very much alike. We're humans and we have human basic needs. We want to be loved. We want to be supported. We want to be included. You know, we want to be a part of something. And so I think when you learn about a culture and you learn to understand it, like when when differences come up, you learn to like kind of see past them because you realize like you now you've gotten to know that culture, you've created a bond, you remember a good experience that you had with it. And you're like, I get it. I understand that. And you're, you know, you can give grace and hold space for people easier versus somebody who's never traveled and not gotten to know anybody else. Like it's harder for them to connect with, with people who are going through trials. Yes. It's, it's, I'm telling you, it's a mind opening, heart opening experience. And, and I definitely recommend it. And, and like she said, she works with all budgets. So if you can reach out to her, I'm going to put her information up one more time and take advantage of what she's offering. She says she'll do from small budgets to big budgets. She prefers small budgets because she treats it <laughs> special. <laughs> I will I will be I will be honest with you. I mean, if you come to me with a really small budget and you're asking for like a five-star hotel, I'm gonna be like, that's not possible. Like let's let's be a little bit more realistic about it. But I do I do want more people to get out and experience the world because I think it'll change humanity. The more people travel, I think the more it helps to change. We could use more kindness in this world. Absolutely. <laughs> So that is going to be the ending of our show. Thank you, Amari Lise, for joining us. I'm thrilled. And always, as I always state, never forget how amazing you are. Never forget how much you are loved. And never forget how exceptional you are. Ajusta tu corona and keep it moving. Yes. Would you like to leave our audience with a message? Um. I'm going to say, you know, quote, ditto to what Lillian, Lillian just said, and um, just give yourself the opportunity when you travel to do something a little out of your comfort zone every single time. And what you're going to realize over time is just the growth process that you start to see in yourself, because it, it is addictive. You'll do something that's a little out of your comfort zone. You'll be like, oh, I did it. Oh my God, I did that. And then the next time you're going to try something else. And then the next time you're going to do something bigger and bigger. And before you know it, you're going to be like, I'm ready. Let's do this. You know, Let's nothing do it. I'm ready. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you so 
much. Thank you, everybody, for watching us tonight. Have a great evening. Good night. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>